Duffy. I'm actually an Inca Krishnan. I'm one of the uh, neurologists uh, here at the Walton Center. I also have got a clinical managerial role. That's as a the the divisional clinical director for the neurology division. Um, now, Jen Duffy, who I will ah, uh, so Jen's um, we have having Teams problem with one of this, so that is why um, Jen's actually at my computer. So Jen's my operational counterpart uh, in managing the the neurology division. So what we both do is we have a oversight about the process that is called thrombectomy, which is what we are showcasing today. Um, just out of interest, if I might, maybe, because um, can I have a show of hands of how many people are external to the organization? And just to let you know that if there is any aspects of what I'm going to say that is not clear, or if I'm using very, you know, medical terms, please feel free to pop your hand up and let me, and I can, I can always explain it. Um, any, how many external members we have? We've got Jane who's got a hand up. Perfect. I'm sure you know people will join through, but as I said, please feel free to um, you know stop me if you need uh, any clarification at all. OK, so I will try and share my screen and I've got a little presentation and I'll explain to you all about you know what we are, what we mean by thrombectomy and what we are hoping to take it to. So where is that? I guess. Ooh. So can you see a thrombectomy screen at all or? Yes. You can see a presentation. Oops. OK. Yes. So hold on a minute, please. Due to some reason, I'm not able to uh, bring that up. So do you currently have on your screen thrombectomy service? You do have. OK, perfect. OK, so for some reason that's not showing on mine, but I'm just going to go ahead with the presentation. And as I said, feel free to stop me if, if needed. So. Um, OK, that seems a bit more better. So um, I'm, this is just a bit of an overview. So thrombectomy is a stroke related treatment and stroke, as many of you might already know, it's a dysfunction of the brain that happens when there is disruption of blood supply to the brain. So disruption of blood supply to the brain can happen due to a variety of causes uh, and all of the disability that comes from that is comes under the broad umbrella of the term stroke. It's a very established clinical dictum that timely action is crucial because you know it's all you'll see it in most posters and sort of um, uh, patient information and uh, community information action plans that time is brain. So um, we currently estimate that the human brain has got about a hundred billion neurons or nerve cells and when a stroke happens for every untreated minute, we are losing 1.9 million um, neurons. So even though there are loads and loads of neurons, the loss with the lack of blood supply is quite significant. And that's why uh, you know, the, it's very important that we act very quickly. So the longer it takes time to restore that blood flow, the worse is the damage and the more millions and billions of nerve cells the person loses. Unfortunately, stroke is a very common uh, condition. So there are, you know, uh, as the as in the, the slide, there's about 100,000 strokes a year, one stroke every five minutes. Not all of those strokes are amenable to this sort of treatment. So there are a specific type of stroke that's called ischemic stroke. That's a type where there is a blockage of the blood vessel because there are certain other strokes where you can sometimes have a bleed from the blood vessel. But the, this one where there's blockage from the blood vessel, those are the ones that are actually amenable for treatment. And quickly clearing the blockage is the treatment. So we currently have two treatments that patients with an ischemic stroke can have. One is called intravenous thrombolysis. This is by which a clot busting medication is given intravenously, and that is done by most hospitals in the regions, what we call as the stroke centers. 
But the other treatment, which is called mechanical thrombectomy, that's the one that we are going to uh, focus on today. That's one that's only possible in specialist neuroscience centers. Now, the even though we've had intravenous thrombolysis for many, many, many years, we now know that mechanical thrombectomy for those who are eligible to have it is one of the most effective treatments in modern day medicine. I mean, at some point, if possible, I would encourage you all to go onto the sort of the stroke action website and listen to feedback from patients who've had and improved from mechanical thrombectomy. And it is overwhelmingly sort of profoundly positive. In, in medicine, we have a figure that's called number needed to treat. So how many patients do you need to treat to get an appreciable benefit? And it's one of the lowest numbers that you need to treat in all of medicine. I'm not just talking about neurology or stroke, all of medicine. That's the figure for thrombectomy. You basically need to treat only about two or three patients for one patient to benefit from it significantly. And therefore, the benefit from it is significant when compared to, um, you know, um, and compared to the harm, let's say. Now, this is a sort of a pictorial representation of what a stroke person's journey will be through. So at the top, you would have seen these um, um, all the uh, information on, you know, TV adverts, radio, etc. about fast. So if you're losing function of your face, arm or speech, then time is of the essence and it is time to call 999. So with patients with what we call as fast symptoms, uh, an emergency ambulance service um, will then take them to their nearest hospital. As I said, that would be any stroke center. And then they would have an urgent scan, a CT scan. And if that scan doesn't show anything against them having treatment, then they go on to have this treatment called intravenous thrombolysis, which is an infusion of a particular medication into the into the veins. Now, some people improve with intravenous thrombolysis and some people don't. So if you don't improve with intravenous thrombolysis, so if your dysfunction from the stroke related to the face or the arm or the speech, or sometimes it can be vision, if that persists, then the stroke doctors in that hospital will immediately start thinking, does this person have a type of stroke that would be make them amenable to have thrombectomy? thrombectomy is a process by which the very clever x-ray doctors, radiologists, they go into the blood vessels and actually retrieve the clot that is blocking the vessel. So if there's no improvement after intravenous thrombolysis, or you have to remember that some patients may not even be eligible for intravenous thrombolysis because there are criteria. The patient goes on to have another slightly more detailed scan. And if they meet certain criteria, then calls are made to the Walton Center to see this is a patient with this problem. Does the patient meet the criteria for thrombectomy? And if they do, another emergency ambulance is called and the patient is transported to the Walton Center. And at the Walton Center, you know, the receiving team assess the patient and then the radiologists, they're called interventional neuroradiologists, they will pass a very fine wire into this blood vessel where the clot is blocking it and then try and retrieve it. So that's the process of it. Now, if you look at the top part of this pictogram, so the thrombolysis bit, the current national guidelines are that we can offer thrombolysis or stroke centers can offer thrombolysis to patients within four and a half hours from the onset of their symptoms. So you can imagine from the time the patient gets symptoms, ambulance, hospital, scan, to having thrombolysis, that all has to be achieved within four and a half hours. Now, that might seem like a long time, but we, we have to remember that it's provided patients recognize the symptoms, that people make the call, that the ambulance is able to get there and so on and so forth. In fact, one of the issues that has been identified about our region, Cheshire and Merseyside, is that the time for patients to make the call from the time that they've had the stroke symptoms is actually one of the longest in the country. So many things can affect this pathway. 
And then you can imagine from that bit, let's say the thrombolysis doesn't work or the patient has got a type of stroke that is suitable for thrombectomy. We've got another one and a half hours. So total of six hours they've got to be offered thrombectomy for all of the bottom bit of the pathway to work. So I'm just a, you know, want to convey that how what a what a time pressured um, sort of situation it is. Now, this might seem like a bit more complex slide and, you know, as I said, I'm more than happy to take things through. But once the patient arrives here, uh, so the patient, the neurology registrar was one of the, uh, the doctors on call, will receive the referrals for the thrombectomy. It's discussed. We accept it and we tell the referring hospital, you've got to get the patient here within this particular time frame to meet the current criteria. And then here at Walton, an entire team will assemble and the team who are involved in thrombectomy is quite large. It involves doctors, specialist nurses, um, interventional specialist scrub practice nurse, radiographers, and then the theatre group, so theatre ODPs, assistants, recovery staff, the anaesthetists, etc. So it's quite a big group that assemble together to carry out the thrombectomy. And from the time that the ambulance arrives, so you can imagine all the variabilities that are possible in this journey from this other hospital to ours. Um, the um, paramedics will then hand over the patient, then our team takes over, they again assess the patient, you know, tell the patient about the process. And all this time there is a clock ticking on in the background telling us you've got to get the, the needle in and put the catheter in before the six hours is up. And once the thrombectomy process is done, the patient is cared for in a recovery setting. And because the Walton Centre currently is one of, as Nicola said, is one of the, you know, it's a standalone centre for um, you know, neurosciences, patients have to be repatriated back to their nearest stroke centre for them to continue their recovery. So we currently don't have a stroke unit at the Walton Centre. So the current arrangement is that we have to get transport for the patient back to the stroke unit which initially sent them here. So again, quite a complex, you know, time limited process that carries on. Now, this is just a history of how thrombectomy has evolved, evolved over the years. So the evidence, you know, everything in medicine is based on, you know, research and evidence and people proving that one particular intervention works. So we've been um, involved in thrombectomy or performing thrombectomy from around 2017. But prior to 2017, there weren't very clear guidelines. So it was done on an as you know, based on a discussion basis. But then if you look at this timeline, it's from 2017, 2018 onwards, we have gradually expanded the service. Initially, it was a um, weekday, you know, during working hours, and then gradually we've expanded it such that from uh, October 2021, we currently have a 24 seven service. I think it's worthwhile highlighting that there are not many units in the country who provide 24-7, even though this is it, it, it's, it's a requirement that we have to be 24-7. It just shows the enormity, the magnitude of the scale of the, the, the process that involves in a unit going, gradually increasing their thrombectomy service to make it 24-7. Now, these are some figures, and I just need you to look at the bottom lines here. So from when we started off with guidelines and processes and when 24-7, et cetera, our total numbers, so you can see 73 for that year, 207 for this year, and we are projected to hit nearly 238 to 250. So the numbers who are um, undergoing thrombectomy is increasing. Of course, our awareness is increasing. The pathway is becoming more streamlined. Uh, and if you then look at this table, it'll show you that though many of the patients come sort of in ours, a good proportion of stroke patients come for thrombectomy to the Walton Center out of ours, meaning that it's an out of ours team who's actually called in and uh, you know, the whole process works that way. Now, 
we are the thrombectomy is a is a is a you know it's a it's a national priority. It is also a regional priority. If you know about our ICS, the Cheshire and Merseyside ICS, who oversee the functioning of the NHS in this region, it's one of their priorities currently. But nationally, there are review processes. We are scrutinised for our um, you know the service, how uh, our numbers and you know the patient outcomes and so on, and you know we feature among the uh, the of the of the centres that offer thrombectomy. We feature quite high in the in the number of thrombectomies that we do, and also that the quality that we provide. But and we also are accountable to our um, colleagues in our regional service. So all the other stroke centres that surround us in Cheshire and Merseyside, and in the case of Walton, North Wales as well. And so we participate regularly in all the governance meetings for, uh, regards to that. Now, it is easy to think, OK, are we getting, you know, are we ticking along nicely? But it, this is not without difficulty. And I, I want to both, both Jen and me, we've been involved in the oversight and the management of thrombectomy now for years, and we are very aware of its successes, but we are also very aware of its difficulties, because this is just a list of the number of incidents or issues that we've had wherein people are involved in the thrombectomy pathway can report it via the either the Datix uh, reporting system, which is for you know clinical issues that have not gone according to plan, or ones wherein we have had to do investigations, etc. And here are the key themes that actually outline what these issues have been about. And you will find that communication features very, very frequently. And this just highlights that entire pathway that I showed you in that slide, because it involves so many people, so many teams, even though the thrombectomy team are all part of the Walton Centre, they're all from different, different specialties of the Walton Centre. And communication and ownership of the actual process is absolutely key in 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 making this function well. Now, again, you know, we we've achieved quite significant milestones in the last five years, but the goalpost is moving. So in April 2023, so it's nearly a year ago, the national clinical guidelines for stroke was updated. So currently what we are providing is if you look at all the strokes in the area, approximately three to four percent of those uh, are actually undergoing thrombectomy and about 12 to 13 percent are undergoing thrombolysis. But the national guidelines have heightened their ambition and they're saying that we should all strive for more, that at least 20 percent should be, you know, we should be aiming to thrombolize. So thrombolize is the intravenous treatment that is given in the stroke centers, and we should aim to be providing at least 15 percent of thrombectomy, so quite significantly higher numbers than what we are currently delivering. Now, we are, these, you know, ambitions are absolutely useful and necessary, especially, you know, considering from the patient perspective, but we also have to consider our infrastructure, our service, what we can provide, the people we have in, what is the, you know, you know the uh, availability of resources and so on and so forth. So this is a big ask, but I just want to um, give the assurance that us, along with our regional teams in Cheshire and Merseyside and North Wales, we are striving to eventually achieve this. I'm just going to slip over this slide, but just to show you. So when the, the new criteria, so if you remember the, the same slide when I showed earlier, the current criteria is that people have to reach for the, the, the thrombolysis to happen between 4.5 hours. But now the current criteria is that Provided the person has certain a slightly more specialist scan, we could be able to provide thrombolysis up to nine hours from the initial onset of their symptoms, okay, thereby trying to achieve the 20% thrombolysis rate. And thrombectomy, this is the bit that's delivered by the Walton Centre, could happen up to 24 hours of the onset of the symptoms, again, depending on certain scan pictures. So, 
we we are predicting that there will be a, an expansion and uh, a, an increased delivery of these services, which again is the absolutely the right thing to do for patients. But we've got to get our service delivery and the resources all aligned up for that. And so there is a big review of the thrombectomy pathway that is underway, and um, of course this might you know, strike more of a chord in, in people who are also working at the Walton Center because the current service as we are currently delivering is, um, you know, if you're looking at improving the efficiency as well as meeting the new guidelines, we've got to expand it. We've got to be thinking bigger. So we are thinking about, um, you know, the, 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 the process in the pipeline are about coordinators, about reviewing the staff that are in place to support the rota. If you remember, I said thrombectomy, you know, patient, we get patients in ours, but also many come out of ours, uh, you know, better, more efficient ways of contacting the multiple members of the team who might all be spread out around the hospital and some members of the team will be on call from home as well depending upon uh, the need um, you know more uh, facilities for keeping patients after they've finished thrombectomy we have a system wherein we have to repatriate patients back but we recognize that sometimes everything doesn't align together the ambulance services take time uh, how do we care for these patients how do we improve our documentation and audit data and more importantly how do we continue to improve the the communication and the relationships between all the team members so that everybody is functioning as one unit and owning the thrombectomy service as you know their service and similarly we are planning along with that so the ISDN stands for the stroke delivery network of the area and the regional groups about how we can exp uh, accommodate the expanded criteria because it's not just about the Walton Center uh, adopting the expanded criteria remember I said that the thrombolysis criteria also expanded so everything from the time it takes for the patient to make a call to the ambulance getting to the patient for the ambulance been recognizing this is a stroke this patient has to either go to one of the stroke centers for thrombolysis or no this is a type of stroke that might actually benefit from thrombectomy and might need to go directly to another center so these are all you know there are so many things that we need to um, to improve on in the entire pathway and and plan accordingly right so i'm going to stop there because that's sort of the overview and uh, i will try and stop sharing and hopefully you can see me back again Okay, any questions or is everybody in, was it quite an overload of information or if there's anything that I can break down and tell you bits about, please feel free to, you know, pop your hand up and I'll try and answer. Okay, so we, um, I can't see any hands up now. I must say, Jen, I'm I'm right, isn't it? There are no hands up. There are no hands, Anita, but there okay. has been a question that's been put in the chat. Ah, um, okay. Which is, let me just have that. Okay. So it used to be thrombolysis within two hours. What has changed the length of time to 4.5 hours? OK, so the um, you know, the, the thrombolysis criteria is I mean, the stroke criteria is, you know, constantly being expanding, isn't it? But the 4.5 hours has been the accepted criteria now for a while. But remember the when I say 4.5, the aim is actually the earlier you get the patient into hospital to have that treatment, the better. So nobody wants to wait for the 4.5 hours to be. So if a patient can get to hospital within 20 minutes of their face or their arm or their speech or the vision going and have another CT, a scan in five minutes and get the thrombolysis going in, you know, 40 minutes from the other, that is the perfect scenario. So even though we say all these number of hours as the maximum point by which they should have the treatment, all of us are aiming for a you know, symptom onset to needle going in and the thrombolysis being delivered as early as possible. Similarly, um, for you know, if a patient is for thrombectomy, it's not that, oh, we can 
um, complacently wait for those six hours. As I said, every minute passes, you know, there are more nerve cells that are dysfunctioning and we need to get them here early on. OK, um, are the extra four repatriation beds going to be in the ICU recovery or on the main wards? OK, so this is, you know, not something that we have identified as a as a as a specific site. Our current understanding and we recognize about the various demands of um, on, on especially the high equity beds, uh, intensive care as well as HDU, etc. But um, it's I, I would be right in saying, wouldn't I, Jen, that it isn't a specific area that we have identified as, but we do recognize that there has to be some form of um, bed space, space yeah. by which we will be able to uh, care yeah. for patients while they're waiting for their appropriate transfer back to their hyperacute stroke unit. Now, one of the advantages and something that I, I, I think is worthwhile me touching upon here is that um, end of middle of last year, Aintree Hospital, which is our you know friendly neighborhood hospital, they became what we call as a North Mercy stroke hub. So previously, patients in the Mersey area, if they had uh, had symptoms of a stroke, they could be taken to the Royal Liverpool, they could be taken to Aintree, or they could be taken to Southport based on where the paramedics thought was their nearest stroke center. But one of the reorganization of stroke um, services has happened was that they made Aintree as the main hub so that all paramedics will divert a patient with suspected stroke to Aintree from the, the North Mersey area. And what that has led to is so Aintree and then develop the Aintree then develop their stroke services. So they the patients are they don't go through A and E, they go directly to their stroke assessment unit. And they the pathway, you remember the, the clock that's ticking from the ambulance arriving to them having the scan, to them going and having IV thrombolysis or assessment for that is all happening very quickly. And we, if let's say a patient requires, it's decided the patient requires thrombectomy, we are then linked to entry by means of a bridge. So you then don't have to wait for an ambulance. You have to make a call to the neurology person saying, I think this is suitable for thrombectomy. The neurology person says, yep, I agree. This is suitable for thrombectomy. So let's bring the patient over and I'll assemble the thrombectomy team. And then the patient comes over. So that's sort of working, you know, a bit more well uh, in terms of um, the, the onward journey here. Similarly, when patients come here, therefore the repatriation back into a hyperacute stroke bed is also easier because then they are repatriated back to the entry stroke bed. So that arrangement has worked very well. We recognize, so just by the nature of neuroscience centers, we serve a very large area. So it is not going to be possible for everybody to be brought to entry hospital, but we do recognize that those sort of hub models will work very well because the more they see of stroke, the more experience the doctors they will get, they will think about thrombectomy very early on and then the pathway works more efficiently. Um, are all um, DGHs able to carry out the more detailed thrombectomy anything, or does it require more specialized equipment? OK, so um, the this is a very pertinent question because especially because some of the newer criteria which we are currently in Cheshire and Merseyside we've not adopted newer criteria but we're working towards it does require um, more um, work it's not that the the equipment completely has to change but there has to be you know more scanning techniques which has to be slightly different and slightly more um, uh, detailed than what we're doing so one of the uh, asks for the Cheshire and Merseyside as well as the North Wales thrombectomy the thrombolysis teams or the stroke teams is that they are actually putting on and training up people so equipment wise things are in place but training up people doctors and others to actually do the specific sequences and then interpret those sequences that is actively happening so every on a monthly basis we have what we call as a regional meeting of all the stroke center representatives doctors nurses managers as well as us from the walton similarly and you know we talk through these requirements and see where people are in in in, in meeting these and it's a very um, collaborative and it's a very, um, you know, it's, it's a very 
positive meeting because everybody recognizes the difficulties the other person is in. It's not a question of, oh, you've not done that, you've not done that. Let's all you know, try and help each other to, 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 to achieve that as best as. Um, do you audit the results from the different hospitals? So, uh, obviously, you can't do anything about the geographical distances, but otherwise, is there a significant variation in the results of different hospitals? Okay, so, um, so the um, outcomes of um, you know patients who have had a stroke and the treatments that they receive, including thrombectomy, it's all sort of collected in a, a sort of a national uh, database, you know, called the SNAP data. And um, so, in some of those, so I, if you remember, I talked about the 2021 GERFT analysis of all the regional uh, thrombectomy outcomes, and and there was no significant variation that was identified currently as far as we know about um, the outcomes from each hospitals. Now I must say that at every point you know if there is so let's say there's a, is a, a thrombectomy last night there's been an issue in something with the pathway it is automatically raised we will then immediately discuss what things went right, what things went wrong, and if there are things that have need to be sorted or corrected, we would invariably discuss it with our counterparts in those hospitals. So we're constantly on the lookout for um, any significant variations that could affect that. You're quite the person who's asked the question is quite right in uh, pointing out what were the geographical things because uh, you know you, we've got uh, we've got this very unique situation where you've got patients who can be repatriated five minutes across a bridge to people who have to rely on an ambulance or an air ambulance from Bangor or even the Isle of Man. And therefore, you know, that notwithstanding, we aim to provide a uniform service for the patch that we cover. Um, right. Could you, um, the next question, could you say a little more about how the specialized scan can lengthen the minimum time from onset to thrombectomy or thrombolysis, please? Right. I'm not entirely sure. Um, I'm actually the most specialist person to um, talk about how that scans going to so lengthen the minimum time from onset to thrombectomy. So currently, with regards to the the current criteria, we can um, you know we, we don't need another specialist scan other than a initial CT scan and then a CT angiogram to look to see whether the blockage of the blood vessel is in an appropriate place that we can do um, with regards to you know retrieving it via thrombectomy. Um, I can certainly get back to you to see how much more different information scans like a CT perfusion. So there are just to reassure you, there are very clear guidelines in the in the in the system about what people have to look for in CT scans and in CT perfusion scans that will indicate whether the person will meet the criteria and you know whether they're eligible or not. I think I would have to leave that question at that. Um, I have I Given, yes, so given the additional training requirements for the thrombectomy scans, could that then result in a delay in thrombectomy treatment for some people in our region if they have to travel for the scan? So uh, let me just make this clear that the scans, they don't have to necessarily travel anywhere for the scans. There's the scans that are required to assess whether a patient is suitable for thrombolysis or thrombectomy is available and should be available in the in each stroke unit. They don't necessarily have to travel to the Walton to have a scan that will then make the decision. Sometimes when patients come here, we might decide to repeat a scan, but that's based on clinical grounds rather than having to travel to another place to do a specific scan that um, you know, to see whether they meet the requirement. I hope that answers that question. And uh, I think that's the end of questions, isn't it? I'm not entirely certain because I'm, I have I come to the end of, yes, I've scrolled to the end of that, yes. Anita, thanks very much. I'm just going to hand you back over to Nikki because um, obviously you've answered all of the questions and I think she'll just close the meeting. Thank you very much, thank you.
Anita, thank you so much. Oh no, don't no 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 worries at all, Nicola. Yeah, I'm so, just sunken in Jen's chair. She <laughs> uh, and so I'm just trying to I'm just trying to operate a controls because I'm at her desk and because my computer has gone, you know, kaput. Uh, yes, that's okay. <laughs> so if anyone does have any questions or they do think of anything once the presentation's finished, they can feel free to drop me an email. Um, I'll then put them to Jen and Anita, and I'll certainly get back to you. And if Anita's happy, if anyone wants a copy of the presentation, I'll be able to share that with them. Yeah, this is um, all. Yeah, perfect. I will also send out a, a short feedback form because it's really helpful for us in the corporate governance office to know what people are interested in hearing about. So all the feedback um, will be really welcome. So if you can fill that in and return it to us, that'll be fantastic. And then finally, I just want to thank everyone for joining today and for putting their questions forward and for Anita and Jen for taking time out of their busy schedule to be able to do this for us today. Thanks very much, Nicola. Thanks very much, everybody, for attending. That's, you know, it's it's always useful to, um, well, share information and as openly as possible and so that you recognise that um, we, are, we are aiming to do the right things. It sometimes takes time, but we are aiming to get there. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye now. Thanks, Nick.